sexuality and sexual violence. Her lived experiences as a survivor of childhood and adult sexual violence, a black feminist, lesbian, and 20 year Buddhist practitioner committed to healing, accountability, and compassionate justice inform the creation of her work. She is the editor of the 2020 Lambda Literary Award-winning anthology, Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Childhood Sexual Abuse, and the producer slash director of the 2006 groundbreaking Ford Foundation funded film, Know the Rape Documentary. Ms. Simmons is a recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the 2022 Changemaker Authors Cohort, a 2020 Soros Media Fellowship, a 2016 through 2019 Just Beginnings Collaborative Fellowship, and the 2019 Breakthrough U.S. Activist Impact Award. She has presented her work guest lectured and facilitated workshops and dialogues across the United States, Canada, and countries in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. She is on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Afroles. That's A-F-R-O-L-E-Z. Thank you for being with us, Aisha. Now, our second speaker is the phenomenal Joanne N. Smith. She is the founding president and CEO of Girls for Gender Equity, or GGE. Ms. Smith is a Haitian American social worker born in New York, a staunch human rights advocate. She has co-authored Hey Shorty, a guide to combating sexual harassment and violence in schools and on the streets. Smith's work to combat sexual violence is featured in the 2014 documentary, Anita Speak Truth to Power, Surviving R. Kelly Part Two: The Reckoning that aired on Lifetime and Netflix in 2020. Her cultural shift efforts and are also featured in Push Out the Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools, a feature length documentary by Monique Morris and Jacoba Atlas that takes a close look at the educational, judicial and society disparities facing Black girls. Additionally, Smith's leadership helped facilitate a $35 million, yeah, you heard that, million dollar commitment from government and philanthropy to invest in community-driven recommendations of the nation's first Young Women's Initiative. Smith is the co-founder of the Black Girl Freedom Fund, a 10-year initiative to invest $1 billion into the advancement of Black girls. And she is a member of the Move to End Violence, an initiative designed to strengthen the collective capacity to end gender-based violence in the United States. You can find Smith on Twitter at Joanne and Smith, that's J-O-A-N-N-E-N-S-M-I-T-H. After this initial conversation, we will expand the conversation by opening the floor for audience questions. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. Now, join me in welcoming Mick, Aisha, and Joanne. Thank you so much, Ayana, for starting us off. Uh, thank you all for being here with us this evening. I kept thinking to myself, I don't know how to express, and yet I'm going to try to express how excited I am to be here this evening and to be sitting in conversation with both Aisha and Joanne. Um, I just want to say as a survivor, as a Black feminist, um, both of you and your work and your contributions have meant so much to me and my survival and my healing. And so this is just such a reward for me to be here this evening and share space with y'all. Um, and to be doing this alongside of Ayana and Elise has been such a rich and enriching experience and has been so centered and healing. And so I'm just so grateful um, and really looking forward to talking this evening. Uh, so 
we uh, we have a lot of questions um and i guess it's just I better to probably just jump right in um but part of what we're curious about ayana elise and i are curious about um and that i think other folks will be interested in is thinking about the evolution of your activism and where we wanted to start was with this big question about your own origin stories how did you get started in anti-violence work? Why did you get started in anti-violence work? What did that look like for you? What are your experiences? As much as, of course, you feel inclined to share with us. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first and foremost, it is really a gift and an honor to be here with all of you. I am grateful for the vision of, of the organizers. Thank you, Ayana and Mick and Elise <clears throat> and everyone else behind the scenes. And um, Mick is also very, everyone is, is quite humble, but I just wanna say that Mick and I have had the opportunity to work together through virtual waves on the Feminist Wire um, for um, when, it, when it was up and running, thefeministwire.com. And it is such a, a joy to uh, co-present um, with my sister friend, comrade Joanne Smith. So really excited. We had an opportunity to share earlier today in a private session with students. And as I shared with Joanne, I could have just sat and listened to her talk the entire time. So it's really a gift. In terms of my origin story, that is, whoo, that's a, how do I say that very succinctly? So first I wanna say I'm a, a daughter of, um, of, of human rights activists who have really just been engaged in struggle since they uh, both were in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee known as SNCC um, to present day and they are in their 70s. So we're, we're talking about you know almost 60 years of continued struggle. So I feel like I always joke and say I was conceived on a, uh, a picket line. <laughs> um, they are divorced now and still long-term comrades and I just wanna lift their names, Michael Simmons and Dr. Gwendolyn Zahar Simmons. I am also a daughter of survivors. So my mother is a survivor, my grandmother's, my great aunt, plural, um, you know, so many more that I, I don't necessarily know for a fact, but believe just based on what we know about the statistics. So, and we know that trauma travels in our blood streams and our DNA. So I feel like I was predestined in some ways to be an activist. I'm also a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and adult rape. <clears throat> so, and, and part of my healing journey um, included activism. Um, and so that that was an integral part. So um, activism, let me also just say therapy, been in therapy with the exception of a two year break since 1992 um, and really believe it and have been believe in it and have been most fortunate to work with uh, black feminist um, therapists who believe in wholeness and well being. Uh, so I, I, as I started out by sharing that I've learned by observing my parents in terms of their activism work, the, the power of, of social change. And so I decided that I wanted to um, spend a huge part. I didn't think I would spend as much time as I have because I am a, a filmmaker, culture worker at heart, and it kind of veered me into being a, you know, a, a full, an activist um, committed to disrupting and ending sexual violence um, initially, I wasn't I wasn't very clear about non-carceral responses, but over time, I've been really clear about non-carceral responses and really committed to um, an, an abolitionist praxis. I also just want to share that I um, my my childhood sexual abuse was uh, it, it um, happened in my family with my paternal step grandfather, who I loved dearly and deeply and was violated from and I told my parents and they didn't remove me from the situation and I think it's I want to just lift that up because I think we really like or we, we know how to handle with good and bad we don't know about the shades of gray so I started out by saying that my activism is a, a continuation of the powerful international as well as national work that my parents have done and 
they didn't protect me when I, I saw a cried for help. And so that these are the complexities that so many of us have to hold. And, and it's really hard because we live in a society that wants binaries, good, bad. And it's really the, the complexities and the shades of gray. So that for me are, are the foundational seeds. I could go on and on, but I wanna hear and learn from Joanne and continue the conversation. Thank you, Aisha. And as you know, No was the first documentary that we showed to young people at Girls for Gender Equity as we were addressing gender-based violence. And it is one of those documentaries that stands the test of time. So I thank you for creating it and having the courage to do it, um, having the uh, resolve to continue um, for years to come before folks finally caught up. I really appreciate you. And Ayana actually um, named the Young Women's Initiative and would fly in from Michigan, okay? Would fly in biweekly to be a part of the Young Women's Initiative economic um, uh, department of it um, to help lend her brilliance and her practice around ways in which we can resource uh, girls of color, black girls and femmes in particular. And so I thank you for your work um, many hands helped to, to generate that initiative. Um, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I didn't know that I would spend Good Friday this way. I didn't know that this <laughs> would be a Good Friday um, until I was told. But then it made sense because when I saw the question that you sent about the origin story, I actually read it wrong. And I thought about the origin of anti-violence. And it made me think of the Bible. I was like, well, that's biblical. I mean, that's before the Old Testament. You know, that's, I mean, what do they want from us? I, I dug up timelines. I was just like, <laughs> I can put links in the chat of the origin of anti-violence and ways in which they were tracked. But it made me think of the Bible. And it made me think of, um, you know, Genesis and, and from the beginning, um, the fight around um, anti-violence and ways in which um, the Bible alludes to it and then directly speaks about it um, from CSA, you know, to, you know, killings happening because of sexual violence. Um, and then I reread the question and I was like, oh, my, my origin story. And I was like, you know what? That's actually still fitting because I'm a recovering Catholic. And as a recovering Catholic, there were um, moments in my history before I left the church um, you know, I'll still go on Sunday with my mother because that's what she wants, but it's, it's not my religion anymore. Um, but at 13 left the church because of having to, um, sit with and not be able to ask questions about and not be able to counter and then ask, needing to ask for forgiveness around what happens to me when it comes to violence. And I didn't understand that it didn't rest well in my body. It didn't rest in my mind. Um, and it was a practice that I just couldn't conform to. Um, I was fortunate, my mother asked me one day, well, do you wanna go? Because I was showing I didn't wanna go and I said no. And I thought, you know, I might be get, I, I just ducked for cover because I might get in trouble. And she said, well, I'll be back, you know? And that was like my break. Um, I, I wouldn't have called it, that's where my anti-violence work began. I wouldn't even have called my family's history of, um, really migrating from Haiti, being a first generation Haitian as where my actual, you know, anti-violence fight began. But it does, like Aisha, make me realize that it's, it, it began in utero. This is something that was passed on to me as far as fighting for survival um, and that spirit of fighting and, and never conforming um, and resisting consistently. Um, so from a practice point, um, when I founded Girls for Gender Equity, I I was really starting a fellowship. I was starting an 18 month fellowship to create the conditions um, for black girls in particular to play sports and to have agency on their body and to get education around HIV and AIDS and all the ailments that impact the black community that weren't being talked about, but were a practice that, that I understood because I was doing that kind of work um, and seeing that young people and girls in particular were rendered invisible in that work. Um, and so in creating that, I just thought it'd be an 18 month project and, and we would identify all the Title IX coordinators in New York City and we would do workshops in the school and we'd provide spaces for young people to play and to learn and to be together. And that 
that would wrap. You know, I had a timeline and a plan. It was going to take 18 months. Um, so very quickly, that timeline and plan um, <laughs> dissolved. Um, within two months of starting GGE, 80 young people came, 12 volunteers, um, and started to replace me in the positions that I was in in, in leading the project. Um, but the biggest, you know, um, uh, tragedy happened when an eight-year-old girl on her way to school at eight in the morning um, was raped on top of the police athletic league by a man who was following her and then left her on the roof and she made her way down and made her way to school and fell out in the principal's arms. And the girls came in that day because she went to the school that they went to um, just telling me what happened and the way they were talking about it had them really try to distance themselves from her. She did this, she did that, um, you know, act like a woman, get treated like a woman. I heard she had on tight jeans. I heard, you know, um, this is what she was doing before school. And, and it was that moment, um, like viscerally, um, physically, I felt enraged and sick. Um, I, I probably did all the things wrong and like shutting down that talk and bringing them to circle and, you know, having conversations. And these are seven and 12 year olds. Um, but then it was that moment that I realized like, this is lifelong. Like this cannot be an 18 month project because this is, this is how black girls, right? Feel disposable um, and reflect on each other when tragedy happens. The empathy wasn't there. Um, and I knew it wasn't their fault. And I knew it was a systemic and community and cultural issue and narrative that we had to shift, as well as a conditional narrative. How do you see an eight-year-old baby walk down the street, disheveled, possibly bleeding, dizzy, and not say or do anything in best eye as an adult? You know, people would pick up dogs, cats, animals on the street in best eye. Um, and so I knew that night that I went home and, you know, had that feeling in my gut that this was my work. Um, and, and, and it was my work to create conditions for black girls to be valued and seen um, and to interrupt gender-based violence. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm just absorbing and reflecting on what both of you just offered us. Um, by way of sharing your origin stories. And I'm just so appreciative. Um, and what one thing I was noting is just like the different connections that, that we all have and how we're um, uplifting and using one another's work in our spaces. You mentioned Joanne, like showing the documentary, um, showing Aisha's documentary as a, a first, a starting point, right? And so like that conversation and then your work with Ayana and then Aisha and I have this connection, right? And so we're having these conversations and it just makes it even so much more magical that we're all in the space together. Um, and I, yeah, I'm interested in connecting these points around uh, where, are, where your work started um, for you. Um, and then how you translate that, like the actual um, products maybe, or the, the actual way that that work shows up or that you do that work. So uh, thinking about nonprofit work, thinking about girls for gender equity, thinking about documentary and filmmaking, um, other types of community work. Like, can you talk a little bit about, um, yeah, like the modes of work that you do and why you might find it important to to be multimodal, right? Like be doing work in all these different sort of ways and um, being accessible through that. Um, yeah, does that, I hope that makes sense, but like sort of just thinking about how, how you do your work. I, I identify as a cultural worker and it's a term I learned from one of my teachers, uh, Tony K. Bambara. And, and so for me, it's more, um, it's it's about creating work that is in service to community. Um, 
And so I started with my film, No, the Rape Documentary, and that took 12 years to make from 90, 1994 to 2006. But even in the process of making the film, um, it, it, it was a Black feminist grassroots organizing process. So I used the screenings of rough cuts at various places across this country and internationally, spent a lot of time on Spelman College's campus. And I share that because today the Women's Resource and Research Research and Resource Center, uh, founded by Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal, and um, is um, celebrating their 40th anniversary. And then they're including the um, the Tony K. Bombar Scholarship and Activism Conference, um, which has been led incredibly by Dr. Bahati Kaumba. These are and. Ayana and I talk about all of that as because she is an alum of Spelman was part of the Tony K. Bambara Scholars Program. So another connection. I share that in terms to talk about how even before No was completed, it was playing a role in doing consciousness raising work around sexual violence, even raising the money to, uh, to make a film, to be a black, lesbian, feminist survivor at the time in my 20s, making a film about sexual violence in Black communities, like even just talking about that work, which it just, it literally just sent chills up my spine hearing about the $35 million that Joanne raised, because it's just like just seeing the power of time and working and staying in the trenches, such as she and so many others have. Um, so for me, my, my work is to raise awareness, to break silences. Um, one of the things I didn't share in the, 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 the opening question was how um, the key moment, I mean, there were lots of moments that I led up was having the opportunity to be in South Africa to observe the, uh, the elections. When Nelson Mandela became president in 1994, I was um, a member of the, uh, American Friends Service Committee delegation. I share that because while we were there and it was, I mean, if you, for those of us who remember the Obama election and anyone who's been to Mardi Gras or Carnival, it was like all of that combined to the 100th power in terms of what the, those that time period in South Africa. And lots of struggles continue and since then. I, I'm not, I don't wanna romanticize, but I'm just saying just for that moment in time. And in the midst of that, women, Black women, South African activists gave me a poster that I have to this day that says one of the most violent social settings is in the home, the crime battering. And there we were celebrating the end of legalized apartheid. And I wasn't thinking about sexual violence. I mean, I'd in, in, at or domestic violence or any of that, right? I had been involved in the um, the anti-apartheid movement on campuses, and and I was a survivor, but I didn't identify as that. And so that it was that catalyst that combined with three years earlier the Thomas Hill um, hearings in terms of really looking at oh my goodness, like what does it mean when you know um, when we're talking about race in the absence of gender, in, in the absence of violence, in the absence of sexuality. And so I wanted to make visible, visual, make a, a, a visual collage of looking at those realities through the voices, perspectives and scholarship predominantly of black women, but also including the voices of black men. So that was my process and journey. In my mind's eye, I, when I started working on No, I was, I was supposed to be done in 96 and I was going to move to LA and be a filmmaker in Hollywood. That was the plan. That was not the, that wasn't the reality. And I, you know, I, it, it was a hard, it was hard, 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 single digits and checking account. And Thinking again about Tony K. Bambara, it was the community that I wanted to name me. That that those are her words, and I and I and I hold them dear because I didn't get those big grants from foundations and funds for many years. It didn't happen till the very end. But and so it was the speaking engagements at colleges and in, in uh, universities and community groups where I would whatever honorarium I received, I would put back into the making of the film. Include and then the international um, uh, um, communities in Europe. And a lot of times when we, th when we hear Europe, we think white because Europe, you know, in terms of Europeans, I also, I need to say, and definitely it was uh, white, white queer feminists who were very involved with helping me raise money, but it was also those sisters and siblings from 
Algeria, from the Caribbean, from country, other countries in Africa, from uh, South Asia, who because of forced migration colonization were living in Europe. And they wanted to use no as um, a reference point to talk about the sexual violence happening in their communities and how can they break the silence with the boot of colonialism on their back. So that for me was the work and, and then continuing with the anthology, Love with Accountability, again, using the Feminist Wire platform to create first and foremost an online forum that was widely accessible of writings by diasporic Black survivors of childhood sexual abuse and advocates and, one, and a bystander who was my mother who wrote for the first time about how she nor my father protected me and talked about that, held herself accountable from the place of being both survivor and also um, bystander. And then turning, transforming that online forum into a print anthology. So for me, I definitely see myself as an activist and my activist comes through in my cultural work. So I want my cultural work to be of service in for organizations such as Girls for Gender Equity, A Long Walk Home, many other organizations and, and, and collectives across this country. Um, so resources for you know, the communities that they serve. So that's how I see my work. Thank you so much. And, and your work is so valuable to all of us and does serve as a resource. I'm sitting with the book right next to me here. I'm thinking about, I think all of us who teach the gender and violence course and many of our courses are using your documentary every semester. So I just wanna thank you for that. And ditto to that, um, I have your book. We use your book within Sisters and Strength Healing Circles. So um, you are very much doing your job and what you set out to do. Um, so I will just name that, you know, I think when we talk about what my role is, I think it's evolved over the years or shifted over the years. So I, I can't even say it's evolved. Um, I will name that, you know, when I started Girls for Gender Equity before that, I, I didn't consider myself a survivor. Um, that, that didn't come until later uh, because I didn't consider the acts done against me egregious enough um, and felt like I shouldn't take up that space. Um, and I think so many times it's so much easier to distance um, and to um, you know, fight for others. I can ask for money and demand money for young people in a way that I could never for myself, <laughs> right? Um, you know, so in starting the work, I started as a practitioner, um, social worker, um, case worker, uh, going to social work school, um, doing therapy at Ackerman Institute for the Family, especially uh, post 9-11 when um, black and brown bodies were being over-policed and continue to be over-policed in New York City um, and where families, uh, we're experiencing, you know, PTSD and trauma, and it was showing up uh, through schoolwork that young people were or were not doing or ways in which they were acting out. And so they would come to us um, for that support. And so when I started Girls for Gender Equity, again, I just thought it was going to be 18 month practice. And then we were going to move on. We're going to go on, fix New York City public schools, 1.1 million students, 1,700 schools, one Title IX coordinator. I was like, that's impossible. There's got to be many. I just got to find them and identify them and share them with people and then they'll know. Um, so we're still working on that. Um, so I think, again, over the years, people have replaced me in my role, right? I was a youth worker running groups with young people um, and then, you know, aged out of that, but also practiced out of that. They were better youth workers and um, more culturally competent youth workers. And I needed to fundraise and I needed to, you know, be at the meetings. And so uh, moving into then the executive director, you know, CEO, who then um, led an organization and um, led it in, or leads it in not just fundraising, but in thought leadership and vision and leads from behind. I think my job is to create the conditions so that young people, Black girls in particular, are not erased, are not silenced, where they can experience joy and their abundant potential and their righteous resistance, because it's that righteous resistance that allowed me to survive. Um, I feel like that's my assignment. And oftentimes that assignment comes in many forms from the, um, the work that's done within the container of the organization, which I will name as a container. It's only one strategy, it's not the revolution. 
Um, it's not the culture shift. It is one strategy towards culture shift, towards policy shift, towards a practice shift, um, towards a philanthropic shift and um, to do it that way, but also through the people who come to the organization to be have also what they need to be able to do what they came here for with the understanding that a lot of people come to this work to heal um, and that we I can't commit to saying you will heal at this organization because that would be taking on too much um, but can commit to say I can create conditions you know where healing can happen um, where you can access resources towards your healing and where, you know, for our young people, we can create conditions for healing to happen. And that's actually one of the things that I wish I would have done sooner in naming, you know, I think when you're, when you're young, I started GG at 26 years old, when you're young, you have energy. And so you're just ready to fight and go and resist righteously. Right. And then you realize, oh, this is, yeah, this, when I said this was lifelong, like, I, you know, I, I didn't mean 30, I meant lifelong, like, I will not live to see um, gender-based violence ended in my lifetime, and so that means then um, I have to be able to practice in a way that allows healing to happen, um, and so I feel like that's a space and practice that I'm in right now, and at the same time, a leadership space um, where other leaders are emerging and, and able to see themselves um, on this journey. I kind of feel like it's, it's kind of lights passing each other and joining each other and there have to be entry points um, for people to join at different times in their journey and career. Thank you so much. The way you talk about uh, your leadership style, the, the space that you create, I think it's so, important and so necessary and I'm, I'm just learning so much and like taking so much of what you're saying in and thinking about how do we how do I like do that right and make space and and center healing um and also I, I just appreciate the way that you talk about um thinking about the the function of of your work and recognizing, which is what we've been talking about, just the role of community and connections and other people doing work in this space and other people doing work in that space and other people doing work in that space um, and how integral that is to just a collective survival. Um, yeah, I'm just so grateful for that too. Thank you both. Thank you for answering that question. Um, part of why we convene this panel today is to think about the connections or like we see the connections, we're talking about the connections, but uh, was to sort of highlight the connections between child sexual abuse and campus sexual assault. Um, and what we find as like a lack of, of information, resources, support for students, survivors who are coming to campus, who are arriving at university as survivors, right? Um, and, and just a lack of, yeah, again, support resources around and knowledge, conversation uh, around that, even in spaces where, where you would think that would be more accessible. Um, and so kind of pushing into that conversation, we're curious um, if you have thoughts or recommendations around university spaces providing support to CSA survivors um proactively you know uh what would that look like what do you have yeah suggestions around that sure i can start with this one because i i, I started with this a little bit in our internal conversation and so for those who were in that conversation sorry if you hear it again um but just knowing that you know CSA survivors have five times higher risk in developing symptoms around PTSD, um, needing mental health support because of anxiety, depression, um, knowing that also, you know, CSA um, survivorship increases actual um, outcomes and possibility of becoming a victim again. And so, and that doesn't leave in college, that's at every stage of your life. Um, and, and that's at every stage of your life for various reasons. Um, I think, you know, child sexual abuse, like it literally rearranges, I think, <laughs> um, your neurons in a way that 
you know, um, just shifts everything you know to be true. And why I say that, thinking about, um, you know, child sexual abuse and um, the one example that I'll use is again, an eight year old. And, you know, she knew this man was following her. Her gut told her. Um, she started to walk fast, uh, but didn't want to be embarrassed. She saw the bodega and was going to dip in, but again, didn't know what to say. And so her instincts to survive were there. Her instincts that something is wrong without even being touched were there, right? And, you know, that gets taken away and shattered. Um, it, it can come back, um, but it's work. And, and it's work that happens where then your instincts and your judgment and your faith and your belief and um, circumstances and people is ultimately shifted. And so, you know, for many reasons, um, child sexual abuse impacts adults throughout all their stages of life. Um, that said, and knowing that, knowing that, you know, through research, knowing that, you know, through survivors naming that because it's all the research we need, um, I believe that schools, institutions, you know, from elementary, from middle, high schools, and colleges for sure, um, especially colleges, um, need to start with the assumption that they are getting, you know, a cohort of young people who are survivors that are coming to their school. That's similar to a gay straight alliance. You are going to get queer students. You are going to get students who have survived sexual violence and other forms of violence. I think they should create space, right, for practice, space for art, space for, you know, physical practice, space for meditative practice, um, space to heal that doesn't uh, require intramural sports or intramural, um, you know, sign up or doesn't require credits. Um, that just actually doesn't even require you identifying as a survivor, it requires actually your opting in to participate in space that's healing space and generative space. I think similarly, I mean, coming even out of, um, you know, and I don't know that we're out or coming out, I don't know what this is, but two years of quarantine and COVID, um, you know, it's the assumption that, okay, the young people have um, need mental health support. The, the federal government's um, allocating $829 million for mental health support for young people. Well, what are you gonna do about that adult who needs mental health support, who didn't get it, and that young person gets it, and now they enter college, and this teacher who has not gotten the support that they needed uh, coming out of COVID uh, does, didn't get that support. They're gonna be a barrier to their progress. And so I think we have to create expectations that mental health support, that emotional support, um, and that you know uh, educational support, um, language around child sexual abuse and um, a bit of normalizing that language in classes, beyond orientation to parents um, will happen. And I think if colleges were able to do that kind of culture shift, um, that would support drastically uh, child sexual abuse survivors um, and possibly reduce sexual abuse that happens on college. Wow, I'm not sure how much more I can add. Um, I, I think uh, I think people don't pe people and so institutions are made of people um, don't want to talk about child sexual abuse because it deals with the family, right? And not that people want to talk about campus assault, right? But they don't want to talk about it. And particularly, what if that family is giving a lot of money to that institution, um, or you know that that's yeah. So that there's so much intertwined there. I think that it is imperative. However, that echoing, let me be really clear what Joanne shared, that we, that campuses really create say, uh, spaces, brave spaces, a new term I've learned and, and, and really want to um, really incorporate more. I mean, I, I believe in safe and sacred spaces and I want them, but I think that before we can get there, we have to create brave space so that we can um, begin to have some real authentic conversations that then lead us to safe and sacred spaces. I think that it is, um, it, it's childhood sexual abuse is foundational to all forms of violence. That is my unequivocal belief. I believe that first because the statistics are so high in terms of how many of us who've been impacted. And then 
we're, we're taught as children as transcends race, class, gender, ethnicity, all of that, when it, particularly when it's inside. I'm not, and people sometimes like to juxtapose trafficking with childhood sexual abuse, and I don't. While trafficking does include sexual abuse of children, trafficking is often, not always, an outsider coming in. And that tends to be a little easier where e we can respond to the outsider. What do we do when the harm doer is inside? And so it's foundational for me because we're, we're taught as, as children to protect the family at all costs, no matter what. And then as we grow on in life, the family extends to the family becomes the school, the church, the mosque, the temple, the family becomes celebrities. We, we see so many celebrities who, because we love them and we feel an attachment, though we don't know them at all, we will defend behavior that just needs to be called in, not necessarily called out, called in, held accountable. We don't do that. So then, and so that I think that in these spaces, and particularly when we're thinking about well, any campus, but particularly PWIs, predominantly white institutions, and thinking about communities of color, where the often the only safe spaces for students of color are within communities of color. Then they've been harmed by a, made a member in their community, and they po very possibly are also a childhood sexual abuse. So it is a double, it, it, it's, it's this compounded trauma, right? They're in this community, that they that they need to survive to get through school they've been harmed and where do they go they didn't get help when they were children so these are space this is why it is so important to create these spaces on campuses where they're like to the best that we can you know not judging or blaming um folks for coming forward and and and, and allowing them to talk about the harm that they that that they have experienced and that the college the institution recognizes that this is part of the nurturing of of citizens to become full functioning um people in society that it is not just strengthening our intellectual scholars uh, capacity our, our rigorous research and scholarship that is very important but not in the absence of healing, not in the absence of, you know, working on dismantling trauma, because if not, as Joanne talked about, you're going to have adults who are un not able to function, who are then engaging with others, pro probably parenting at some point, and then replicating these forms of harm. So I believe that institutions of higher learning have a tremendous responsibility to incorporate and include childhood sexual abuse in all of their work that is looking, that addresses campus sexual assault, because it is a straight line for so many people. Thank you both. Thank you. I like all I, all I can say is thank you. I'm just, I'm learning so much. I'm thinking so much. I'm like so engaged and then I'm writing notes and I'm just so thankful. And I think you both offer just such uh, important, just even like concrete steps for us to move forward as we're doing work at the university. Um, some of us in faculty roles, some of us doing uh, student affairs work. Like I think that all of us can work together to like make some of these um, resources and support services the possibility um, because I agree that it's just necessary. I'm thinking about too something that y'all both touched on um, in your responses earlier. We're thinking you kind of both talked about how you came to um, identify as a survivor yourself um, and like your relationship a little bit to the word. And then when you, Aisha, were just talking about brave spaces, I'm thinking about um, one of the questions that we had was also around public survivorship and what it means to one, like claim the word survivor for yourself, thinking about your own experiences and then what it means to like live out as a survivor to, to talk about those experiences in a public way, like you're talking about it today and like you do in your work um, across the board. So like, it's just thinking about, how did we phrase it? I just wanna make sure I get the question exactly right. Um, oh yeah, just tips that you might have for folks who might be just beginning to share their stories publicly and just how you've managed that yourself. Um, yeah, just being out as being a survivor. 
I have a very small piece to share and then I'm going past the mic to Aisha um, to drop the mic. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I named that it took me until adulthood to identify as a survivor. And, and again, it took me um, understanding what survivorship is about um, and understanding what then, um, I guess, trauma that I, and PTSD that I was experiencing was about. And so um, to that person who, you know, was thinking, um, well, it wasn't egregious enough. It wasn't, it wasn't that story. So, um, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't claim it. You know, this isn't a tribe necessarily folks want to claim. Um, but you do want to have honest conversations with yourself and honest reflection with yourself. And you want to pace yourself and identify for yourself um, whether that is a term, if that is an identity that, um, that you own, that you agree with. Um, you don't ever, ever have to share being a survivor. You don't ever have to share your survival story. That's okay. Um, if you decide to, be sure that you're sharing that for the right reasons um, and be sure that it serves you. Understand that um, you know, public survivorship um, could have consequences from family um, to friends to then, you know, everything is saved on the internet now. So yeah, everything is written about, you know, so it's not an identity that, you know, will just go away. It's also not identity that you have to live into. I think everybody's journey is their own and story is their own. If it's survivor, being a survivor is not the title or name that you want to equate to your experience, that's absolutely fine too. Um, I think most importantly is to, you know, know and understand, you know, what it, what it means um, to have survived sexual violence and abuse um, and to ask for what you need um, so that you're not acting out, um, so that you're not internalizing the harm um, or so that you're addressing how you're acting out and internalizing the harm. Because um, I think even, you know, having a space and place like support groups within colleges or around colleges um, to even try to figure and work some of this out is just extremely important. Um, you don't have to have it figured out um, before going into those kind of, you know, braver spaces, as, I, as Aisha would say. Mm, wow. Um, public survivors. So I think that there are layers to being a public survivor. So I've been out as a survivor for a long time, maybe 30 years, like since the early, since the 90s. Um, and I would say that I was a rape and an incest survivor, but I never talked about what incest looked like. I didn't say who, what, when, why, anything, just said incest survivor. It's only been really, I mean, fully, clearly, tangibly within the past seven years, since 2015. And I, at that point I was 46. So, so, so in the early nineties, I was in my twenties. So from early 20s to 46, I only could really go into detail about my rape. And even then I didn't get into all the nuances and complexities of that because there was a one night stand with someone else the night after the rape. And then I became pregnant and had a safe and legal abortion. So there are all these things so that I, I would only tell parts because I had sh shame about the one night stand after the rape and questioning. So there are all those kind of layers that I've been able to pull back as a result of my, my activism and culture work and engaging with therapy and, and other um, activists doing this work to understand, oh, wait, oh, I did have a right to bodily autonomy. It's okay that I had consensual sex the next night to try to, you know, to deal with the trauma from the night before. I mean, you know, in terms of all these ways of not blaming myself. So I think that 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 is, I just want to just share that, that the, the public survivor um, identity is, is constantly evolving and changing. Um, and I think echoing Joanne, it is really important that um, people are, I, I fully support anyone who's able to come out, to be out, I want to be clear. And then also to just be be um, as much as you can be clear that this is what you want to do because we are in an internet age and unless you have a lot of money 
to digitally erase things. It's there and it could be used against you because we live in a misogynist, patriarchal, uh, white supremacist society where these kinds of um, identities to me, I view are badge of honors, not so much that we, not so much that we were violated or our bodies were invaded against our will, but that we survived that's the badge of honor, that we are working on our healing and thriving. So I think that that is really important um, just to be aware. Um, and I wanna say that I am out and I credit Audre Lorde uh, in terms of the, the notion around being out. I mean, out as a queer woman, out as a survivor, because I never wanted it to be used against me. Meaning if I were hiding in the closet about my sexuality or hiding about my sexual violence, that someone couldn't, um, that someone could use that against me, which is more the reason why I started like spelling out my whole kind of sexual violence experience around having been raped and having consensual sex with another person less than 24 hours after the rape. Not only for myself, but for so many where their stories may not be exact duplicates of mine, but they're parallels. And then they don't think that they've been raped because they had sex the next night. And we hear these stories, well, she was with this person or that person afterwards, or he was with this person or that person afterwards. So for me, my public survivorship has been my, my shield, my protection. That's where I found solace, where I found refuge, where I found comfort. I also honor and recognize that not being out about being a survivor is where someone else may find their solace and comfort and protection. So it's really about where one feels safe, where on, on that spectrum and honoring it. Um, but as I said, for me, it's really about being out and, and letting folks know that the shame is not on me, that I was raped, that I was molested as a child. There's no shame on me. And I don't wanna even put shame on the harm doer, but that the wrong, that happened, the harm that happened is 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 as a result of the harm doors. So I'm not going to be ashamed that I was raped. I'm not gonna be ashamed about that at all. And 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 so that's why I'm out, not only for myself, but for all those who cannot say it, so that they hopefully will not feel shame. Thank you. I feel so affirmed uh, by what both of you have shared just now. And I hope that folks in the audience are also absorbing that and feeling affirmed too. Um, yeah, thank you. We are looking forward to opening up for Q&A in just a minute. I'm gonna ask just one more question, just really about the work that you're doing now. What are some of the projects, campaigns, or initiatives that you're currently working on? And if there's ways that we can connect to your work after the event so folks can find you. Um, and I, of course, already shared where, the, uh, where folks can find you on the internet, but if there's other things that we can be aware of that we can provide support towards, um, yeah, if you would love to share that with us. And folks in the audience, please get your questions ready and feel free to drop those into the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, well, for me, I'm kind of shifting a little. I mean, always survivor centered, always survivor centered. But really, I'm well. I'm working on the on the third part of a trilogy. So there was no the rape documentary, and then love with accountability, which focused on on documenting the voices of 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 diasporic black survivors so first no was just really survived cis women that was how i defined sexual violence i thought that that was that's who was impacted by sexual violence thankfully for evolution transformation education recognizing that sexual violence knows no boundaries and so then expanded um my understanding my definition had and replicated that in in love with accountability to include the voices of cis men of trans men and women and gender non-binary people as well as cis women all diasporic uh, black folks really talking about sexual abuse and um, healing um, and accountability um, so this third project is is now looking more inward I was like kind of looking outward which is where I was my comfort zone in terms of getting the voices of others and looking at my journey um, um, as a survivor and as an as an activist. So that's that's what I'm working on. The, um, the, so the um, tentatively titled Love, Justice and Dharma. And speaking of Dharma, I'm 
I've been a long-term Buddhist practitioner, but now moving into teaching, meditation, um, and really wanting to focus on healing like that just it, it, for my own work because I've been I'm burning out and also just really wanting to offer um, resources and tools to other survivors. So that's that is a huge part of my work now um, doing doing that work, but continuing to do I have participate in opportunities such as this. I'm actually in San Diego and this afternoon Pacific time will be leading a three hour workshop around um, the, the transformational power of storytelling to disrupt childhood sexual abuse. Um, so doing book readings with love with accountability now for the first time go, doing things in person because for two years everything was virtual. So grateful for the opportunity um, for that work. But for me, it's really, um, Focusing on, on on healing and non-carceral accountability, just thinking about the somatic responses and how how we're handling and dealing with it. Because I think that there's so many of us, including those of us who are in the trenches doing this work day in and day out, who are wounded healers and they need and we need sources of support so that we don't reenact versions of the harm that we experience because we're burned out. And I I, you know, I Again, lifting up Tony K. Bambara's words, it's like, are you sure, sweetheart, that you want to be well? You know, it's a whole lot of weight to be well. Being well is no trifling matter. And so that's what I'm, I'm focusing on. And it's a little, it's kind of like, I always feel like, oh, am I being too woo-woo? Am I not committed to the struggle, to the people? And I am. I am committed. I am just focusing now on, on wellness and healing. Really looking forward to your new project and just uh, just in support of your healing and your wellness. Thank you. I can't wait to read your work. I feel like it's so necessary. I mean, one of the things that I learned was that, you know, obviously healing is lifelong. None of this is linear. Um, and, you know, I shared earlier there were times I thought I forgave people and it was easy on sabbatical to forgive, but then to come back um, into the work, into the fry and, um, you know, to, to see same dynamics and um, same what I consider wrongs, you know, that's then triggering and, you know, then I have to start the process over, um, but it doesn't negate what happened before as far as healing and, and that journey and forgiving. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't ignore what's currently happening, right? And so when I think about, you know, one where I am personally, um, healing is lifelong. And, um, you know, being on that journey of healing um, that shows up in advocacy work that I do, that shows up in my personal life, my spiritual work. Um, right now, one of the tangible things that I'm doing um, is writing a book and it's not titled yet. Um, but the impetus around it is loving Black girls and really um, being able to um, show community. And when I say Black girls, I'm talking about girls 18 and under, I'm talking about femmes, I'm talking about gender non-conforming young people, um, and being able to show, you know, not only Black girls, but, you know, the ones who love them and don't love them, why they should um, in many aspects of their lives and the ways in which Black girls contribute to our culture and contribute to our history of advocacy and and joy and innovation and why black girls are so necessary and should be valued. And so that has been a huge labor of love while working full time. Y'all writers are amazing, hats off. I am learning a lot about myself in that process um, from vicarious trauma and understanding you know, how real that is. Um, um, to you know, my, my own writing and my own writing style and, and um, the stories that need to be shared and told. Um, part of that trajectory, of course, is you know, Girls with Gender Equity is turning 20 years old this year. In June of 2022, we became a nonprofit. Um, that was after the September 11th start of the fellowship um, because, you know, as I shared, circumstance let me know, oh, this, this can't just be a little 18 month project. This has to be um, something much deeper and much more committed. And so we chose the nonprofit route. And so um, we get to celebrate our, in ritual, our 20th anniversary celebration, June 23rd at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, get your tickets. 
Um, but we also, you know, get to reimagine um, how we do this work. And so three ways and buckets that we do this work in is, of course, cultural and narrative shift work. Um, you know, to be able to tell the stories and write Black girls into history and into the narrative. Um, one of the things that we're doing is archiving our work so that, you know, the last 20 years doesn't just disappear. Um, and, you know, so that it's held not only at the organization, but possibly at colleges where we can archive Black feminist leadership, as well as the many contributions that young people have played in, in this work over the last 20 years. Um, you know, beyond culture shift work, our policy work is extremely important in our you know, core areas are, of course, education equity and um, interrupting the criminalization of girls, young people, and their families, um, and of course, interrupting gender based violence and sexual violence. And so, um, those three policy areas on the uh, local, state, and national level um, are ways that we work um, to shift institutions and systems um, that need changing, um, and many of them beyond reform. Um, you know, in real time. And then of course, direct practice, because there's no way you can come to this work without being this work. And, you know, we do, our young people do. And as young people, we have to meet them where they are in their youth development stage. Um, and they deserve to be met there. And so our practice of, you know, healing circles, our young women's initiative um, and advisory council, uh, speakers bureau, uh, just us, um, program that supports girls who are formerly incarcerated or system involved or in threat of being system involved. Um, and so we have uh, various programs, you know, that supports the direct development of young people and are deepening that work. And so you can find us at ggenyc.org. Um, there's much more to share. The website is way more robust than I could possibly be. And there are many ways that you can get involved. So feel free to email, feel free to reach out, feel free to follow us on social, and um, we'll gladly oblige. And then can I just share that um, my film, Know the Rape Documentary, for if anyone hasn't seen it, is available for um, streaming rental. And I when and during the height when COVID happened, I reduced the rate to a dollar. So it's a dollar streaming rental for individuals um, for 72 hours. And it's available in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German subtitles, as well as English caption or without any or without any captions or subtitles. So just want to say that that resource I intentionally kept um, wanting to make it accessible, particularly during the height of the pandemic when so many of us were sheltering in space, place and wanted them, wanted folks to have access where it was um, accessible. Did no originally come out on VHS? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's good. VHS. That's, that's what I we had VHS. in office. <laughs> yeah, VHS and a DVD, and then I was dragged kicking and screaming to make it digital. And now I'm like, oh yeah. Like, so, I love it. Yeah, VH, I still have the VHS. I tapes. still do too. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Um, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Joanne. Congratulations on 20 years. That's huge. That's amazing. Um, I would love to know more about that celebration at the Botanic Gardens. So, um, yeah, congratulations. And your book project sounds really fascinating, and I look forward to reading that too. Um, fantastic. Thank you both so, so, so much. I'm going to pass it to Elise, who's going to facilitate the Q&A session, um, but I'm still going to be here. I'm going to be tuned in um, excitedly, but I'm so grateful again for just the conversation that we just shared. Thank you, Mick. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mick. Thank you, jo Joanne and Aisha, for so much of what you've shared. I shared this earlier with um, Aisha. Is no is particularly part of my journey in working in the anti-sexual violence field because I saw a screening of it in 2006 and I bought the DVD um, when I was uh, graduating college and made my graduate school cohort sit and watch it and have a conversation around sexual violence. Um, and so I definitely encourage everyone to stream it and I will be at the Botanical Gardens to celebrate with you all as well. So I'm ready to switch over to questions. We already have one question in the chat um, from Yasmina. And the question that Yasmina has is what has been 
the most empowering step within this journey of spreading awareness and the unconventional truth about sexual violence. Joanne, I was waiting on you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to reread the question. Good. But go ahead, if, you, if you're ready. Um, when I think about the most empowering step, there is a liberatory feeling of not hiding, not shrinking, not disappearing. Um, and, you know, not, like I said, uh, experiencing um, harm as something that you have to stand alone in. Um, so um, for me, of course, when, you know, a young person can come and say, you know, thank you for creating GGE. I was suicidal before starting. And now I can not only name what happened to me, but I can forgive myself. I can, I found sisterhood and siblinghood here. Um, I found myself again. And, you know, I, I don't credit myself for that alone by far because I'm not the youth worker who work with them in group. Um, but I could see my, my part in that journey and feel like, okay, like it's, it's all for, at times you think it's all for not, especially, you know, um, how capitalism works. Um, but, but that's what it's for. Right. And so I think, you know, in empowerment and in, um, you know, purpose driven work, um, and healing driven work, um, and humanitarian work. I mean, that is what, that is the core of, of why um, we're doing this work. And so for, for me, you know, that's the most empowering step is when young people can reflect back what was originally, and it's always the purpose. Um, and, and for spreading awareness and the unconventional truth about sexual violence, that's a really good question. Unconventional truth about sexual violence. Um, That's a really hard question to answer, but you know, I I will say again one of the things that I named earlier um, when we were in our you know um, internal session with students was in about two at about 2012 New York Post um, headlines read um, violence is down rape is up and you know, it was a headline that stopped me in my tracks because it was a moment of really understanding what we're up against um, when patriarchal violence strikes and understanding that rape and gender-based violence isn't considered, you know, a continuum of violence and a part of violence. Um, it's considered, you know, gender-based violence and then devalued because how possibly could rape be up and, and violence be down? Um, you're not talking about then this kind of violence. You're talking about gun violence and 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 robberies and you know other types of crimes. Um, so then you're not associating the crimes and the harm that is committed um, to people through sexual violence through CSA, you know, as something even worth um, holding people accountable for. Um, and so for me, that was I think the a really stark moment of unconventional truth um, that I didn't really expect to experience or read, but it was just, you know, such in plain sight um, for it to be stated so easily and so clearly um, that I, I, it changed me. I, I couldn't ignore it. For me, um... What's been empowering is when people see the film or um, read uh, the anthology um, and and feel affirmed um, from 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 the testimonies. It's been um, I think for me that's been really very powerful because especially with no because it took twelve years. It was single digits in a checking account. It was so many grant grant. Um, foundations and funds saying no and people with deep pockets saying no 
And there were, and, and then there were some yeses. My dad used to always say, you know, you only need some, you only need a yes, you know, like you don't, don't focus on the no's, focus on the yeses. And so again, echoing Joanne in terms of around, like when you are struggling and trying to make ends meet and trying to create the work and, and you're like, what am I doing this for? And then someone says, you know, this film really transformed my life. This, you know, this is, I see myself, I see my story in this film. Thank you for affirming my existence. That that is just like, oh yeah, that's why I'm doing the work. That's, that for me is, um, that's very, um, very empowering. Um, and to, and as a, as a, as a, as an artist, cultural worker, like to, to be able to um, share the message, right? So that I'm, home or I'm not home right the second but like no can impact folks and I'm I don't even have to be around or the love with accountability can impact folks and let me be very clear the work I am you know vision for it and created but it would not exist without the voices of something like I think I counted like 80 voices that are in, in combined between no and love with accountability so I'm happy to to have the vision and to to birth it but I could not without the collective. Um, so to be able to provide resources, provide roadmaps, all these different roadmaps, each testimony, each chapter is a roadmap from which people can pick and choose and say, oh, I like that, oh, I want that, or that doesn't resonate for me, to create your own healing path. And so that for me is important. And in terms of you know the unconventional truth of sexual violence, um, you know, it, and no, there are people, I mean, now it just seems like, oh, people, we talk about this all the time, but I got so much flack for survivors saying, I said yes to one form of sexual activity, and I, I but I, I didn't say um, yes to all forms of sexual activity, or I went on this date, or he, you know, he was my boyfriend, or there were so many people who just felt like it, what I was sharing wasn't rape, right? So that was, and again, I was working on it from 94 to 06. It's a very different landscape. Think about all what we're hearing and have access to, which I think is a gift, not the trauma, not the horror, what people experience, but that we can see all of the complexities, that it's not the strange, unidentifiable person in the bushes. It's not the innocent um, girl who, or boy, who's been assaulted because it's just like, what, how do we define innocence? What is innocence and by whom? And so I, for me, the unconventional truth of, you know, that work that I think came out in no long before we we're talking about it in the way that we are talking about, I, I think has, has also been affirming because I really was just like, after the film was done, a lot of affirmation, but also kind of a lot of critiques around like how I was quote unquote making black women survivors look bad because of the whole politics of respectability around those issues. And so now we're in a time when, I mean, those are still real politics of respectability and people still judge and shame and blame folks, but there are many more voices, many more resources that really are pushing back against the narrative. And so I think that that for me is what I'm grateful to, to be able to be a part of that um, and just dispelling all of these myths that reinforce the silence and allow the violence to perpetuate. Great, thank you both. Yeah, I, definitely the connection, the breaking the silence is amazing. And so we have another question in the chat. Um, why do you ground your work in black feminist politics? Um, how might Black feminist perspectives on childhood sexual abuse and campus assault be illuminating for everyone, especially people who are not Black feminists? <laughs> um, we talked a little bit about this in, in the private session earlier. Um, for me, um, historically, black, bl black people, Black feminists, Black survivors have been on the margins of society. They're not the only ones on the margins, but we've been on the margins. And it's very important to center, for me, the margins, because when we center the margins, then everybody comes in. So that's really important. Speaking as a cultural worker, for me, with no, um, and in love with accountability, as in, in terms of the anthology, I these are universal 
harms that happen. So childhood sexual abuse, adult rape, this is happening all of the time across the globe. What the work that I've created asks you to look at it, think about it, reflect upon it, analyze it through the lived experiences of, of, of Black folks and, and through the lived experience of a Black feminist culture worker who's creating the work. And so we're not, historically, we haven't, we're not trained. We can see all the struggles happening now around critical race theory, around don't say gay, around so much now. You know, we're not trained to center the margins. We're not trained to respect and value the expertise of Black feminism, which in my opinion has shaped so much that is happening in this country, not by itself, in tandem with so many other feminisms, because there's not just one feminist, there's multiple feminisms from multiple communities of color, as well as radical anti-racist white feminism. And so for me, what, what the work for me is, is, is to center and to change, to shift our landscape about what is the center and to recognize, particularly in this country, when we think about the foundation of this country on genocide, enslavement, rape, you know, for indentured servitude, forced migration on of so many um, people and, and descendants of people who are living here now, that it is, I think, imperative that we we lift up and center these perspectives to look at um, realities that impact all of us. Because I believe that it is often from the margins that then we think about how to not only heal the margins, but to, to make societies including campuses, but not only campuses, to make society more humane, more recognizable. And when I say Black, or when in response to Black feminist politics, and this is my own ongoing evolution, it, that Black feminist politics has to also include a disability justice framework. We have to remember our sight impaired, our deaf and hard of hearing um, of communities and our physically disabled siblings. We have to include transgender, gender non-binary, folks that if we if we really are committed to disrupting and ending these forms of violence we have to make sure that no one is left behind and so for me it has been through black feminist politic that i have learned these principles and have applied it to the work and so that i can't think of any other way to do it than to do it that way Y'all see what's going on here. This is why exactly why Aisha needs to go first because she lays the foundation and the groundwork and you just build on it. And that's what she's done her whole life. Um, why not, I say, why not black feminism is the center for me and many of us, if not all of us for feminism as a whole. It really is. I mean, right now in this moment, this may not age well, but we can't ignore the fact that a book called Bad and Bougie was written by a white author <laughs> and just who didn't cite any black authors, black theorists, right, in the book. Um, just, you know, appropriated culture and wrote her book and um, was really proud and got, you know, a system to support her in that. Um, I hear the book has been recalled. We're, 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 we're following. Um, I think a fine should happen. So accountability can happen, but um, that's another story. Um, the reality is that all social justice efforts benefits um, when we really invest in leadership, um, invest in strategies, invest in the innovation of black women and girls and femmes, whether we're talking about immigration rights, racial justice, repro rights, um, repro justice, environmental justice, you know, um, we have to have an intersectional lens. Um, and understanding that, you know, black and brown folks are the center. Black and brown folks built this country. It's the land we stand on. It's, it's the culture even outside of, um, you know, institutions and practices. It's the everyday culture um, and rhythm of cities, you know, of communities um, that black and brown folks lend. And so, you know, having a black feminist lens is just a is this natural? It's it, it's important, um, you know, to uh, ground black girls and young people um, in black feminism so they understand how we survived, um, and they understand that you know it's a legacy of um, strategy and black brilliance that it it that it didn't just happen um, that they come from that kind of legacy um, and that practice 
you know, of black femmes and gender non-conforming young people, um, you know, being supported when direct violence happens to them or structural violence happens to them or cultural violence happens to them isn't a practice that, you know, they're just lucky to have. It's something that their human right is to have and our responsibility as community is to provide. And so that's why. Thank you both so much. We're just coming up on our time together. That was amazing. Um, and it's so great just to be in the community and space with you all as we, um, you know, really continue to uh, celebrate is a weird word, but <laughs> sexual assault awareness month. But You're also not just closing us out because I, I mentioned bad bougie, are you? <laughs> I mean, what better point to close out on? <laughs> But thank you all so much. This has been amazing. Um, I definitely um, encourage everyone to continue to seek out and find all your work and engage. Thank you so much um, to Mick and Ayana for um, helping co-coordinate this space. And we look forward to continuing these conversations in the months and years to come. And thank you all again. To be continued. Thank you all so much. To be continued. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much. Thank you. This is wonderful. <laughs>